Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Create Difference Maps for NASA data using Panoply, Giovanni, and Excel Earth Data Webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. While everybody's logging in here, you do see the two optional polls at the bottom left and middle portion of your page. And for those of you who have already provided feedback, we really appreciate this. Um, I've got 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we are going to go ahead and get started here. First, what I'd like to do is go over some logistics related to this webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a couple of days of completion. All presentation files will also be available for download at the end of the webinar. Regarding timing, the webinar is one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation and the live demonstration with an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. After <coughs> Our speaker has finished his presentation. What we'll do then is we'll move to the final set of polling questions, and then from there, we'll transition directly to the Q&A period. You will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout all portions of the webinar, with the exception of the very brief live demonstration by using the Q&A pod. And again, this works like a chat. Questions will not be answered using the raising hand function today. It has been disabled. And then one final note, depending upon the volume of questions that we receive, I'll extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 p.m. Eastern Time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. Let's move next to our agenda. I'm going to pull that up for everybody here. During, let's see, all right. During the first 20 minutes or so, our speaker will provide you with step-by-step -step descriptions of how to make difference and anomaly maps using NASA Giovanni and Panoply. From there, he will provide step-by-step -step descriptions or instructions um, on how to quantify uh, Giovanni or Panoply generated difference maps using Excel. Okay? Uh, during the second half of the webinar, our speaker will provide examples of difference maps. And then what we'll do is we'll end with a live demonstration of how to relate locations to data values within a difference map. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. James Acker, who is a senior support scientist at the NASA Goddard Earth Science Data and Information Services Center, or just DISC. Jim? Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> just make sure that you can hear me. We can hear you yeah. fine. Thank you. Um, see our first slide and um, I've been looking forward to giving this webinar for a couple of months after I um, started making difference maps with Giovanni Panoply and Excel um, the title slide here shows a um, difference map and it's the difference between the sea surface temperature in the year before the big El Nino that we just experienced and the year during the big El Nino and as you can see there's a very broad area of um, warmer sea surface temperatures. Now that's not surprising. What's surprising is how easy it is to make maps like this with Giovanni and Panoply and to use Excel to quantify the values in them. Now we know, and you, many of you already know, that either a difference map or an anomaly analysis is a very powerful mapping technique and it's used very widely, especially in places that change is occurring. And one of the things that's been added to our new Giovanni, which is um, We've had it available for a while, but we keep adding capabilities, is the flexibility to create a lot of different kinds of anomaly maps and difference maps. And that's what I'm going to show you <coughs> in, this, in this webinar. OK, so I have three objectives for today's webinar. The first objective is to demonstrate how to create a difference map using the net CDF output that's available from Giovanni and the NASA Panoply data visualization package. The second objective is to demonstrate how to employ the two data files that you used for the difference map and Microsoft Excel and an Excel macro that we wrote. And that will provide you a quantified difference map data from what you just made in the form of latitude, longitude, data value, ASCII text triads. And this is 
um, good for people that want the data, very simple form, numeric form, and um, allows us to provide that capability. Now, the third objective is to provide several different examples of difference maps that show both anomaly analysis and change detection um, to show you some of the things that I've found you can do with it and to inspire some ideas amongst you on how you can use difference maps for your various research objectives. Okay, so we'll move on to part one. This is the step-by-step -step description of how to make difference maps and anomaly maps with Giovanni and Panoply. And what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at some October rainfall anomalies in New England, as you can see. And New England in the fall is actually quite dry. <clears throat> There's not nearly as much rain. But every now and then, things, things can happen. A hurricane can show up, things like that. And so if you get heavy rainfall, that'll depart from the dry baseline. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the user-defined climatology capability. If you click on this button, you'll see our menu of options, and you'll choose user-defined climatology. And though in this case, we're going to use the years 2004 to 2016, and we're using a product from the North American Land Data Assimilation System, which we call NLDAS, rainfall. And note that I've chosen October. So what I'm doing is to make the climatology is averaging the rainfall for all the Octobers between 2004 and 2016. And this map would be New England. I'll show you that it is in a minute. Those are the coordinates. When you're done with all that, you click Plot Data, and that'll generate your map. Okay, now I won't show you the map because that's the first thing you get. Um, I'll show some examples later what they look like. But once you've done that, on the left side of the Giovanni screen, you'll see these options. Okay, and there's a downloads option. So you click on the downloads option and that shows you these options right here. And three of them are image options. And the fourth one is a net CDF file, the one at the top. So that's what you want to click on to download. Okay, so. You've done that. Now we're going to go back. I'm not going to show you this step, but you would go back, click back to data selection under your map, go back, and you put in the options for October 2009. So all we're going to do is your end date and beginning date are October 2009, and we'd switch to time average map. Okay? You do that by choosing 2009 and 10 for the month. Don't change the region. Plot again. And then once you've done that, come right back up here and you download the other net CDF file. Okay, so now you have your two files. And now you're going to make a difference map using Panoply. Now you can see on the screen where Panoply is located. It's easy to find by Google. That's the actual URL. And Panoply is available from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, associated with us, but up in New York. And um, it's a multifunctional net CDF, HDF, and GRIB data viewer. It runs on your own computer. So you download it and install it on your computing system, and it requires Java SE8 runtime. Um, it works in the Java environment. Okay, so once you have done that, once it's working in your system, you will launch Panoply, and then you will open up a file. So you would go to File, click, and open the October 2004 to 2016 file. And you click on the Rainfall Data Line. And there's the rainfall. Also in the file are metadata, latitude, and longitude. Once you click on this line, the Create Plot icon lights up. It gets nice and colorful. You click on that to create the plot. OK, and then you use tabs at the bottom, you would see, to adjust your map. Um, you center it on your location, things like that. And then you make a map that looks like this. So this is the climatology from Giovanni plotted in Panoply. And I'll talk a little bit more about the palettes, but it has a number of wonderful palettes. Okay, so this is rainfall ranging from 0 to about 200 kilograms per square meter. Okay, so now we're going to make the difference map. So we're going to open up the October 2009 file. And when you do that, then you get a combined plot option that lights up. Okay, and you can see the two files here. When you first make the map, it might not look interesting because it doesn't optimize the output for differences. Okay, you can go to the Scale tab, and then you would click on the GMT Polar Palette. Okay, and this is a palette where it's got blue for one, the negative values or the low values, 
a white section in the middle for things that didn't change much and red for high values. Now, I want to point out that Dr. Schmunk, who is the author of Panoply, emailed me, and there are many, many other palettes like this, some of which have been written and made for specific types of data. And you can download, and you can download them and add them with a click to Panoply. And the Earth Observatory in the building next door to us has authored many of them. They're beautiful you have put the palette in is then you'll select the data minimum and maximum. So under scale you will see values and so you can put in the largest value both for the minimum and maximum. I call that balancing to make the scale the same for the highest values and the lowest values. Okay, Panoply is very fast so as soon as you hit enter you'll see the map. Okay, so here's my result. Okay, so this is an anomaly map for October 2009 and you can see that there are some areas inland, over here in Vermont, southern New Hampshire, along the coast in Maine. And it turns out, I did some um, quick reading, and it turns out that there was some rainfall that came through late in the month. And it did target southern Vermont, New Hampshire, also central New York State got it. So this shows us that that's somewhat of a confirmation that what we're seeing here is, is accurate. Now, if you want to make a difference map rather than an anomaly map, instead of choosing the quasi-climatology and averaging over several years for one of your two files, you would just choose two different time periods. So you could compare October 2008 to October 2009 and say that it rained more or less in one of those two months. Okay. Now I will point out very quickly that Panoply provides borders. You can adjust the coastline, different outputs, higher resolution. You can take the grids out. You can also adjust your title as well. So it, it's got quite a bit of labeling capability as well. Now our next step is to move on and use Excel to quantify the results from that. And instead of using an anomaly, I'm going to use a difference map, just as a demonstration. Okay, now this returns to the sea surface temperature comparison that I showed in the title slide. Um, and this shows a difference in sea surface temperature for the Pacific Ocean near the Galapagos Islands. Here's the Galapagos Islands down here. And I'm comparing the period January, March 2014 and January, March 2015. And the developing El Nino happened in late 2014 and early 2015. So as you can see here, sea surface temperature was higher in 2015. So we see, after plotting the map, we see more reds. So I'm going to use the two files that I got from Giovanni, NetCDF files, that I made the difference map with, and I'm going to show you how to quantify these. Okay, now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use Panoply to get them into comma-separated variable format. Com yeah, comma-separated values, sorry, CSV. Okay, so you go into Panoply, and you click on File, and you go down to the Export Data, and you find Export Data as CSV. And you do that for both of your files. And you also, for this step, you want to get the latitude and the longitude data as CSV files, CSV files as well. So we get two data files and one latitude and one longitude file. OK, now, I was talking to Jennifer. And at the end of this presentation, and also available on our new website, we're going to have a new website for the Goddard Disk in just a few weeks we will have data recipes available, and this will be one of them. And Jennifer will make that available at the end. So there are a lot of little details described there. These are the basic major steps. OK, so the first thing we would do is open one of the CSV files with SST data and save the file in an Excel workbook. And we would name the sheet 2015 SST. I recommend short names. You'll see why. Then you open up in that workbook, you copy the other file into the workbook, and name the sheet for that, in this example, 2014 SST. Then you create one more worksheet, one more spreadsheet. And you name that difference. Okay. And then there's a very simple difference formula. It's a subtraction. And you subtract one file from the other. And you can see the formula right here. You type that into one, one um, element of the Excel array. And then you copy it into every single, um, every single cell of the array. And then that will calculate the difference values. Okay. Now here's an excerpt from a difference value. Now I did one step before I made this 
this particular output screen that I'm showing as an example, which is inserting a text value, NAN, which you can do in the next slide, which I show you how to do in the next slide. That's simply so that when you do the final output, it makes sense. Okay, so now we've got a, a workbook with a spreadsheet that is difference values. Okay, so again, the detailed steps are described in the recipe. Okay, and you have to, the macro that we've made for this follows a specific format. So there's some small steps that you have to do to make sure that the macro will give you the right output. Okay, so we're going to take the different spreadsheet we just made, and we're going to copy it into a new workbook. And this workbook has to be saved as a macro enabled which will have the suffix XLSM um, in order for the macro to work. And then, as I was mentioning, you take, when you first copy it in, because it's still a formula, it will have a error message. And you convert the error message to a text string. Okay, and I, sh I call that NAN. That was chosen by a particular spreadsheet. Okay, and then after you've done that, you add a, you add a couple of border rows, and the macro is expecting those, so it's getting the values in the right place. Then you take the latitude and longitude values and copy them into separate spreadsheets. And then you also create a blank red spreadsheet title result. And that's very important because the macro expects to write its output to a spreadsheet named results. If you don't have a spreadsheet named results, it won't work. Okay. And the macro, which we call reorganized sub, is written by Gary Alcott, a colleague here. Um, you install it into the, into the workbook, and then you run it, and then you get a list of latitude, longitude, and data value triads. And over here is an example taken from the output for the SST map. And so you can see the latitude, longitude, and the SST difference. Now, I found out that there is a limit of a little bit more than a million rows in Excel. Sounds like a lot. We're actually looking in this case at four kilometer data for the Pacific Ocean, which is a big area. And it was easy to exceed that. OK, so if you're trying to do results Stuff for a big area, you're going to have to break it up into smaller areas in order to use this, this technique. All right. Take a pause for a second. Now I'm going to show you different examples of making and using different maps. Okay, and I will say this is the fun part, because when I first started doing this, I really literally was having a lot of fun. There were a lot of different things I could think of to compare. Um, some stuff I'd done previously um, that I could apply this to. So that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, early on, I took a map. This was posted on Twitter. Um, and I compared the snow, f snow depth in December of 2016 and January 2017 over North America. Um, if you've been paying attention to the weather, California was hit with a lot of snow in January. And that shows up really heavily here in the Sierra Nevada. You can see that it snowed in much of eastern, northern Canada, Quebec, Ontario. You can see there was some snow on the ground in the Midwest, and that started to melt a little bit, little very light shades of red here. There's also a little lake effect snow zone, if you can blow this particular slide up, right off of Lake Ontario. Now, if you've been listening too, you know that February 2017 was very, very warm, pretty much globally, but also quite a lot in North America. And um, a colleague of mine, mine made this one, looking at the air temperature at two meters in our NLDAS system. And you can see the reds, oranges, yellows, um, that it was very, very warm over much of um, the eastern United States, up, in, up into Canada. But you can also see that um, the storms coming in, dropping snow in the west, managed to keep the temperature um, close to normal or a little below normal. Now, um, last year, there was an outbreak of fires. Um, unfortunately, they were appeared to be set by humans in most cases in the US Southeast. The reason these fires were so devastating and tragic and destroyed hundreds of homes was that it was extremely dry. And this was a very short-lived drought. Um, it may still be occurring, but it happened very rapidly. And this one particular area stopped receiving rain at all. And so I plotted two plots in Giovanni that compare the rainfall in September, October, and November of 2015 to the rainfall in September, October, and November of 2016. And this is the same scale. And so you can see this is hopefully a fairly normal rainfall pattern and very little rainfall. But you can't really quantify looking at the two. And so 
make a difference map, and the difference map gives you the output. The units here are kilograms per meter squared, but um, one of the capabilities of Giovanni is we could actually convert this to inches. That capability exists in the system. So you could get the output in either way. In either case, we see all of these red values indicating the real severe rainfall deficit. And I noted the proximate location of the city of Gatlinburg, which was where some of the fires came down out of the hills and destroyed lots of homes. So this is a good resource to say, really, how much rain didn't this area get? OK, now this is a revisit of something that I did a few years ago. I wrote a paper about looking at chlorophyll observations in the northern Red Sea. Um, and we found um, some interesting things. And one of the keys to the paper was that there was a bloom in March of 2000. Okay, and actually, this is a daily value from C, daily image from CWIS that was plotted by the Earth Observatory in this nice palette, and this was on March 16th. And you can see this bloom. It actually turns out that the circulation of the Red Sea influenced the location of this bloom. So I took Giovanni, and I made a climatology for March 1998 to March 2007. So this is for the month of March, and this is the month of March in 2000, which is when the bloom occurred. And the bloom didn't last a long time, I'll tell you that. OK. And so when I make the difference map, I find out with all the red values that this, these chlorophyll concentrations were higher than normal. OK. And you can see that looking at the two, but this, this gives you some good quantification. Now, it does turn out there is some seasonality in the Red Sea, but March is not when you see normally see the highest concentration. So I got lucky, um, literally, um, getting this nice, pretty bloom that allowed us to say some um, insightful things about the Red Sea. OK, now another thing I will point out, and I want to, this allows me to talk a little bit about the quasi-climatology capability in Giovanni. Um, previously, in our previous system for Giovanni, we received some climatologies from data providers, but not very many. Um, because making a climatology is a very detailed thing, and the Data provider treat the data in particular ways, make sure they get all good values, they filter them, massage them, they do a number of really important things. With Giovanni, we have data that has been, in many cases, processed, because we have what's called level three global gridded data, but not necessarily that final quality data that goes into a climatology. So that's why we call it a quasi-climatology. OK, now you can make one for any length. Now, one reason you might do it is that you know there's a period where the data was missing. Um, instruments go down. Um, there were lots of clouds. So you might not want a period, and so you want to make your own period. Another thing that can happen is that you have done some work, and you want to compare to the baseline you used in that work, but the provider has moved on. He's got two more years of data in the climatology he's providing. So that's why we give you this capability. Okay. Now, we did have a climatology of chlorophyll in the earliest earlier version of Giovanni that allowed us to look at anomalies. And I had this, and um, I was going to the American Geophysical Union meeting, and I said, I wonder what we can do with that. And every year in the North Atlantic, there is a bloom. It's called the North Atlantic bloom, amazingly enough. And it's a seasonal bloom. It moves from south to north as the sunlight moves north, gets brighter. Okay. And when I did this, one particular month really stood out, and that was April of 2003. Okay, and so here's the map, the blue, I mean the white arrow here shows this area of blue and purple that was a big negative anomaly. And you can see that over a lot of the western side of the Atlantic Basin, there was blue. A little bit over here was, was red, but predominantly blue. And I also, also want, I also want you to note this area of white right here. So the question was, why was this happening? And I did know that on the East Coast, we had a lot of rain in that April. OK, so I surmise that the cloud cover might be higher in the month of April, which might mean less sunlight. And the phytoplankton were waiting for sunlight to bloom, and they were late. And so at the time, all I could do was take the whole area and make a time series of cloud cover. And this is the MODIS cloud fraction data product. And so here is a plot of the cloud fraction. OK, and you can see here each of the month is labeled April is blue. May is orange, June is green, and May is magenta. And you can see that the total cloud cover for the whole area was higher in April 2003. So that was a support for what I thought might have happened. 
Okay, but now I've got the capability of looking at it spatially using our difference map function. So here is a climatology of modus cloud fraction for this region from April 2000 to April 2016. And that's the Giovanni output there. And this is April of 2003. And so we're going to make a difference map for that. Note this bright area here, because then we make the difference map. Here's a difference map. And you can see pretty broad areas of red indicating higher clouds than the climatology. A little bit of blue in here, but also some more red in here. Now this actually is a result of the sea ice mask that's applied to the MODIS cloud data. Okay, and it turns out that the sea ice was persistent. There was more sea ice. If you remember, go back one slide, here's this, this area of white. Is also, there was no ocean color data because it was covered by, by ice. Okay, so that particular little additional information tells us that it was a colder and cloudier April than normal, lending support to <clears throat> the anomaly being late. And the phytoplankton had to wait for the sunshine, and when it finally showed up, they bloomed happily in May. Okay, and so now the final thing that I want to show you is using another measure of green, not chlorophyll in this case, but the normalized difference vegetation index, which is also called NDVI for short. Okay, and in this case, we get the um, NDVI from our partner, the Land Processes DAC in Sioux Falls. Now, just so you can orient yourself to NDVI if you're not familiar with it, NDVI 1.0, if it's a value of 1, means it's, the whole area is completely green. It's like the Amazon rainforest. There's no breaks in the, in the, in the uh, canopy, completely green. And if it's 0, it means there's nothing green at all. It's like the pavement of the, of the parking lot. Okay, so in between, we have various fractions of greenness, and that's what NDVI, NDVI gives us. So I'm looking at an area familiar to me, which is where I live and where Goddard Space Flight Center is located. And we're going to use the months of May 2000 and May 2016, which is smack dab in our spring growing period. Okay, and the data product is 5,600 meter resolution. And here you can see I've, I've shown where Washington, D.C. is. It's a bit wider there. Here's Baltimore up here. Okay, and so this is May 2000, and this is May 2016. Now, visually comparing these, there's differences, but it's very hard to pick up any level of the difference. So that's why we want a difference map. Okay, and so here is the difference map. Okay, and I want to note that these are small values. Uh, the range for the palette is 0.3 to negative 0.3. Okay, but there have been changes. Okay, that on this particular map, I'm pointing out a couple of areas of interest. And letter A, just to the north of us, is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Patuxent Research Center, which is an area of un not developed. It's a wild area. Okay, just to the north of that is an area where a, a mall was built, the Rundle Mills Mall. It's very big. Now it has a casino. Lots of housing has gone in. And so you can see some negative changes there. Now, C is near where I actually live. There's a watershed pr provides drinking water. And it shows it's a little bit greener. That means that the upper watershed that supplies the creeks and streams that flow into the reservoir hasn't been developed too much. It's still green, which is good for the drinking water. And then D is Dulles Airport. Dulles Airport continues to expand, adds more building. They're adding a metro that comes from the city out to the airport. And so you can see that that area, whatever green was there, a lot of it is, has been diminished. And finally, Montgomery County has an area where they preserve agriculture. They basically tell the farm, they, they're protecting the farms that have existed there. And so there hasn't been a lot of development there. And you can also see it's a bit greener in this May, too. Now, that bit greener could have been a little rainier, could have been a little warmer. But those are some different areas you can see, you can really detect the change. So here we are. And I've already clicked on the first one. And this location here, can you see that there's my little pointer cursor? OK, so I clicked here. And you can see this is the Fish and Wildlife Center. Greenbelt Goddard is right here. And here's the Fish and Wildlife Center. Now, it's actually, we can switch over to the Earth view. And you can see that you know, this is a nice green area. So we have 39.06 and 76.78. So here is the spreadsheet of the difference values, latitude, longitude values. And I located the nearest two pixels that I could find. And this is 0 0.007 or 0 0.006. And so that's an even less there in these two adjacent pixels. So you can see that indicates virtually no change. 
and that's what we want to see. We, we know that that's an area that hasn't been um, developed. Now, just north of there is the Arundel Mills Mall area. We're going to zoom in a little bit. And so here is the mall. You can see the mall, housing, they're still doing some more development here. So we'll get that location. And that is 39.16 about and 76.7. And so we go back here, and I also highlighted these. And you can see a definite negative value for the NDVI there. OK, so that shows you the detection. I'll show you just a couple while we're here, just a quick um, looking around. Here's the reservoir. Here's the upper watershed area I talked about. Over here is Dulles Airport, right here. And this is the where Poolsville is in Montgomery County. You can see the fields, and that's the um, Montgomery County Agricultural Reserve. And to the east of that, you can see the corridor of Gaithersburg and Rockville, where there's um, growing development along the I-270 road. OK, that's all I have. OK, now, for your reference, and um, just to go over just briefly what we just went through, here's a summary slide of showing the procedures that allow you to do the difference maps and allow you to do the quantified location list. OK, and so to make the difference maps, we're going to make two maps for comparison in Giovanni, download the NetCDF file for each map, and then we open one of the NetCDF files in Panoply, create a map in Panoply, and create open up the second NetCDF file and create a difference map, which is a very simple one-click operation. And then you can customize that any way you want. OK, now to make the list, we export, excuse me, we export the data from each Giovanni NetCDF file to a CSV file. And that requires Panoply. You also export the latitude and longitude data. And you create an Excel workbook with one of the CSV data files, copy the data from the other CSV data file into the workbook in a second spreadsheet, and calculate the difference between these two spreadsheets. Once you've done that, you create a macro-enabled Excel workbook. You take the difference value spreadsheet, copy it into that, and the latitude and longitude data, you format the spreadsheet, and you apply the, you apply the macro that we've written. And that converts your two-dimensional array into a list of latitude, longitude, and data value. So that's all that I have. And finish up with a slide that I found combined the natural world and the human world with a fishing village. And um, I would like to take any questions you have and see if I've inspired any ideas. OK, thank you, Jim. Thanks, everybody. At this particular point, what we'll do is we'll move to the final set of polling questions. We're actually running a little bit uh, early, so we will give these questions you know, three minutes or so. And from there, we'll move directly to the question and answer period.
Okay, everybody, we're going to give the polling questions just another minute or so, and then we'll move directly to the Q&A period. Okay, everybody, thank you for your input on these polling questions. At this point, we will move to the Q&A period. And if you will give me a moment to pull up the first question. <clears> okay, <throat> here. Okay, so our first question, given that there are so, so many different data sets with fairly cryptic names like GLBAS, NOAA, 025, et cetera, and some are based on observations, some on models, some combined. Do you have any suggestions for deciding on which data sets are best for particular problems? Um, that, that's a good question. We have a document that was developed for our, um, it's called the data, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact title of the project I was on, but it was using Giovanni for climate change education. And um, there is a list of variables that we developed there of interest to climate change that was also some of the more basic variables you could use. Um, and we will put that back online as some of our educational resources on our new website. So that's something to be consulted. Um, I plan to put all of those resources online um, because we had some really good, long, detailed explanations of what some of these variables um, we're good for. They should probably still be accessible from the DICE website, which I believe is dice, D-I-C-C-E dot S-R-I dot E-D-U. Um, but if you search for DICE project, D-I-C-C-E, you should be able to find those. Um, like I said, we're switching over our, our website, but we will have resources under education. Okay, thank you, Jim. The next question is, and I, I did answer this in part, but I'd like for you to provide additional um, input on this. Is there any kind of cookbook exploring possible data recipes? Um, yeah, we do. We have, but in addition to these, we've, we've had um, inquiries from our users on a lot of different things. Um, we have a GIS expert that's written several on how to use Giovanni data in GIS. I've written a couple. Um, this is one that I've written. Um, and um, we have it available on our site. We're also trying to make a uniform standard in the entire DAC system of NASA to allow other recipes from other data sets. Um, if you have any questions about where they are right now, you can email our help desk, and um, they will probably direct you to me, and I can tell you where they are currently on our website. And when we switch over to our new um, website, then um, I know, looking at the test site, that there is a specific category for recipes, so they shouldn't be too hard to find. And um, we will have them, yes. Okay, and just a note for everybody, feel free to email me as well, as an, and I can provide either referrals back to the Goddard DAC or Jim, and I can also send you links to where the recipes are currently located. All right, so our next question is, where can I download the macros? The macro is in the recipe. And so it's a, for, the macro for Excel is in the recipe. Jennifer's gonna make that available. Um, it'll be a file you can download, and you just copy it out of the copy it directly out of the recipe and put it into Excel. If, and it explains how to do that in the recipe if you haven't done it before. Um, and I know that it can be done because I had somebody who didn't know how to do it at all, and I sent them the recipe, and they sent, sent me a, an email next the next day and said it worked fine. So it's um, my description is 
apparently detailed enough to make that possible. Okay, thank you, Jim. And so what I'll do, everybody, is I will upload that file once we're completely finished with the Q&A portion into the file sharing pod, which you should see located directly below this, the Q&A. Uh, you'll see the presentation files available both in PDF format as well as PowerPoint for, format. Okay, so the next question, Jim, is in selecting an area of interest for data analysis and mapping, can one enter multiple areas? Um, not at one time. I mean, if you wanted, I mean, if, eh, not totally sure how to answer the question. I mean, if you want to do an actual exact comparison, you need to have the same boundaries for each region. So um, there is no, there's no constraint on doing one region and then the next region and then the next region. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. If that doesn't answer the question, if you could provide Rephrase. Ad yeah. additional clarification in the Q&A pod, that would be helpful. And then the next question um, was basically, I think this has been answered, um, but Ed, if it's not, you know, let us know in the Q&A pod. He was asking where you can get the macro. Right. Yes, and no then question. saying, thank you for ending with the format. I can import into ArcMac the Excel triad. Are there any additional questions at this point in time? Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> Is there some suggestion for R and QGIS users? Could you say that again, please? Is there some suggestion for R and QGIS users? Um, not, not a suggestion particular for difference maps, um, but for for R, we do have a, at least one recipe that addresses using the data and putting it into R. Um, I'm not sure of the full nature of that one. Um, Panoply doesn't give you a, um, I don't know if Dr. Schmunk's on or not, it, it only gives you a certain variety of output options as well. Um, and so you'd have to look in Panoply and see what the output options are. Okay, thank you, Jim. Are there any additional questions? I just I will note that if you if you have more questions about Panoply, um, Dr. Schmunk is the author, and you can email him directly, and he's um, very responsive. And frequently, if people suggest something that looks like a good idea, he will modify Panoply and bring out a new version with that idea incorporated. Okay, and so is this contact information available by way of the Panoply site? Yeah, just go to the Panoply website. Okay, great. And then the next question is, where's the best place to get answers to technical issues using Giovanni? Our help desk. Email the questions to our help desk, and uh, we will direct them to the developers. And your uh, help desk email is? Um, I'm pretty sure it's gsfc-help-desk at list.nasa.gov. But there's a link on our homepage. And the home page, Tina, I'm going to type that into the share pod for everybody's benefit here. Just one moment. Okay, while we're waiting to see whether or not there are additional questions, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the files for today. If you were to click on any one of the presentation files, uh, you would be prompted to download those files. And this will be a persistent feature if you access the recording by way of our online Adobe Connect catalog, which is the tinyurl.com Earth Data Webinar. That is if you're interested in downloading the presentation files at a later date. And our next question is, regarding the multiple Excuse me, regarding the multiple areas, several large lake areas and different watersheds compare lake temperature differences over years or time periods. Um, I'm not sure if using the, if the difference map method is the best method for that. Um, one thing that can be done with pretty good accuracy is a time series. Okay, I'm not, I mean, this is, this webinars on how to, how to make the difference maps, but we also have the capability of doing time series. And you can also do the time series similar to the way that you do the climatologies, is you can actually do a seasonal time series. And we say seasonal, but it can be for a season, um, like spring, or it can be for a particular month. 
So you could actually compare the temperature for a particular location in your lake um, over several Octobers, for example, and you can plot that out as well. Um, and I actually have a recipe that takes the output and shows you very, a very easy method to put it into an online plotting package um, called Plotly, and you can make multiple time series that way. So if you wanted to compare five lakes, you could put all five time series into one plot like that. Okay. Now, for the difference maps, you might want to do a comparison of the whole, if the lakes are, like the Great Lakes, you might want to do a difference map of the entire Great Lakes area for, against your climatology for a particular year. So you can combine the time series analysis and the, the um, difference map analysis that way. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Are there any additional questions? If there are no additional questions, what we'll do is we will log off from the telecon component of the webinar, but I will leave the virtual meeting space open for an additional 10 minutes, and during that time period, I will upload the uh, data recipe so that if you're interested in downloading, um, downloading the recipe, you'll be able to do so. And though I do see a couple of uh, additional questions and also some input. Plotly is great. Good to see recipes for open data exploration using different online tools. Thanks, Nick. And then the next question ha is, does Panoply have a tutorial document? I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Um, I know that recently we were actually in a discussion, and we were looking for a user's manual, and there is an older user's manual online. Um, so I don't know if it actually has a tutorial. Um, it's not hard to learn. Um, I was surprised at how easy it was to learn when I first started working with it. Um, so I recommend sort of diving into it, um, installing it, and then if you have any questions, like I said, Dr. Schmunk, the author, is um, quite responsive to questions. Okay, thank you, Jim. And then just an additional point for the participant with the Panoply question. We did host a uh, NASA Aquarius data training workshop last April, and with that, there were a series of you know, 10 to 11 very short, five to six minute long Panoply tutorials, um, you know, completing specific functions with the tool. And then I will point out, too, that um, in the next couple of months, I'm going to be adding many videos about each of the different visualization functions in Giovanni. So um, you can watch. We have a YouTube channel called NASA GS Disk, so you can look for those, too. OK, great. All right, if there are not any additional questions at this point, what we'll do is we will log off from the audio component of the webinar. And I do thank all of you for joining us today. Anybody? Any further questions? Our next webinar will actually be held on April 27th and will feature uh, some step-by-steps on how to use, how to manipulate specific land processes data products using R and Python, and they will conduct these demos with a Jupyter Notebook if you're interested. That announcement will be coming up on the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar, where you can also sign up to receive announcements for upcoming webinars. Um, if you visit that particular link, I should have the next webinar posted very soon, certainly this week within the next couple of days. All right, well, thanks, everybody, and thanks to our speaker. Thank you very much, everybody. If you have any right, questions, too, we'll about... We'll log off from the audio, and I will upload the data recipe. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A pod. I'll leave the virtual meeting space open until 3 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. Thanks.